Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 482nd New Social Environment. I'm Anya, the events assistant here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and the privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Karen Brooks Hopkins and Brian Dorries with special guests Rufus Wainwright and Jorn Weisbrot, who will be joining us later in the program. We're thrilled to welcome poet Nora Claire Miller here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Wincy, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions, which I will post shortly. And now to introduce today's guest and host, President Emerita of the Brooklyn Academy of Music, Karen Brooks Hopkins, worked at the institution for 36 years, serving 16 as its president. Her widely read book, Successful Fundraising for Arts and Cultural Organizations, is currently in its second edition. Following her retirement from BAM in June 2015, Hopkins recently served as the inaugural senior fellow in residence at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, board member of the Jerome L. Green Foundation, and senior advisor to and board member of the Alexander S. Onassis Public Benefit Foundation, among others. Writer, director, and translator Brian Dorries currently serves as artistic director of the Theater of War Productions. Dorries' books include The Theater of War, What Ancient Greek Tragedies Can Teach Us Today, The Odyssey of Sergeant Jack Brennan, and a collection of his translations of ancient Greek tra tragedies uh, titled All That You've Seen Here Is God. He has received an honorary doctorate of humane letters from Kenyon College, and in 2017, he was named public artist in residence of the city of New York. So please take it away. Thank you so much, Anya. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back uh, in the new social environment uh, and back with Karen Brooks Hopkins, uh, my friend, colleague, mentor, collaborator. Um, Karen and I were last year together when we had the privilege of interviewing our mentor and friend, Peter Brook. Um, and it's only fitting, I feel, at this point that we return uh, to promote Karen's new book, BAM, and then it hit me, uh, an um, incredible uh, exploration of her 36 years as uh, one of the leaders of BAM and ultimately the president of BAM, uh, and its transformation as an institution and the transformation of Brooklyn and its relationship to that, and of course, to the arts and culture as we know it in New York City, and also to fundraising itself. And that's what we're here to talk about. We really don't wanna shy away from Karen's great gift. Um, one of the arguments at the center of Karen's book is that there is an art to fundraising for the arts. And if there is an art to fundraising for the arts, then Karen is one of the greatest artists of our time. And um, I would argue that that's the case. Um, and um, before getting started and, and asking her a few questions, um, I just want to read a section of the prologue of this book, um, and before even mentioning the book, I want to just acknowledge that um, because of supply chain issues uh, that are happening during COVID, the physical book is on its way to a warehouse where it'll be distributed, but you can pre-order it now by um, hitting at any time during this discussion or thereafter by um, linking to one of the links we're going to put in the chat right now. We're going to put the uh, link to the book itself. Um, you can also already now download the Kindle version We'll link to that pre-order the audible version and a little bit later we'll give you a link to her upcoming book launch event event at bam on february 17th with oscar eustace her interlocutor and friend so here in the prologue of karen's book bam and then it hit me uh she sums it up um in one sentence um and that is uh, in one paragraph my story can be summed up as follows. At the age of 29, I interviewed for a position in the development office of the Brooklyn Academy of Music, or BAM. I was hired and worked there tirelessly for nearly four decades, eventually ascending to the presidency, helping to raise millions of dollars for the institution while it became one of the most significant cultural centers in the world. BAM was and still remains the epicenter for contemporary experimental performance in all disciplines. During my time there, we re revolutionized the nonprofit arts model built an enduring institution and elevated Brooklyn's place on the cultural map. All those years, I never looked back, not once. I had neither the time nor the inclination to pause and ask, what does this mean? What can be gleaned from all that we've accomplished and what else must be done? A little reflection might've been a good thing, but at the time it was not in my playbook. So 
that's a I, I think a great summary of uh, you know what uh, Karen's book uh, really uh, addresses um, the challenge of and on you can take the cover off now so we can go back to our community here uh, the challenge of uh, building an institution and reflecting on it at the same time and then this time that Karen's enjoyed since retiring from her position at BAM has really led to not just reflection but also self transformation and growth in ways that she recounts in her book. Um, I think uh, without going too far, you know, out on a limb here, I just think that anyone who's interested in uh, nonprofit arts management, fundraising, leadership, women in leadership, um, the history of Brooklyn, the cultural landscape of New York City needs to get this book and read it. Um, but we're going to give you a little preview of what's inside. I'm going to launch by asking uh, Karen a first question. A little bit later, we're going to be joined by friends of Karen, uh, Rufus Wainwright and Jorn Weisbrot, who need no introduction. And then we're going to go out to you, the audience. Um, we'll just you, just raise your hands uh, and bring you into the conversation whenever you feel so moved, what resonates with you, what touches you, and what Karen says today. So Karen, uh, one of the things you say in your book is uh, the first thing you need to know about fundraising is that it's not brain surgery. Uh, it's harder than brain surgery. Um, and I wanted to just go with a big softball question first and say, tell us about your theory of fundraising and uh, why fundraising is harder than brain surgery and what does it take to be an effective fundraiser uh, in the arts? Well, first let, uh, I mean, this is, a, this is a very tough question because um, there are so many pieces to the answer. Uh, but let me just let me just talk about the good and the bad of the whole process. The first part of it is that uh, there's a kind of nobility in fundraising, and that is um, something that, if we embrace that, makes us feel better about having to deal with it, do it all the time. And what I'm talking about here is that because in America we do not have government support in any large way for the arts. Uh, we need to raise money. We need to raise money from a variety of constituents, foundations, corporations, high net worth individuals, lower level members, from galas, from art auctions, you know, keep going. There's a million different strategies. Um, and when I talk about the nobility, it, it is noble because we have to forge a deep and profound connection with the public and the people that exist in all of those constituencies that I just named. And in order to really engage them and keep them close and get money from them, we need to be the very best institutions that we can be. So in a crazy way, fundraising helps us to be great. So there's the positive side. On the other side, and why it's harder than brain surgery is that a fundraising campaign is like a military operation. You obviously have all your flanks. I just mentioned them, foundation flank, corporate flank, and so on and so on and so on. And you need to have a strategy and operation in each one of these areas. You're going to take a lot of casualties along the way, meaning that rejection is in your life every minute. And if you are not tough, and if you have a thin skin, you will not be able to do this work. You need to provide a lot of service. You can't make mistakes. You can't miss deadlines. You have to be on your game. And even when you are completely on your game, there are still massive rejections. Um, donors can really do what they want. For the most part, it's their money. And you can never forget that. So committing yourself to this process can be exciting when you hit it. There's a big adrenaline pump, you've succeeded, you feel powerful, and then five minutes later, you get five rejections. That is the nature of the thing. So you've got to be able to roll with it and you've got to have a campaign that's flexible enough so that when one thing falls out, another replaces it. It's very important in a fundraising campaign that you have a very broad base of prospects. Otherwise, things can fall apart extremely uh, fast. Well, let's talk about things falling apart because I want to go back to the origin story itself of your time at BAM. Uh, one of the most sort of gripping parts of the book is 
uh, you recounting the deficits out of which you had to climb and bring the institution one after the other after the other, brought about in large part by uh, the visionary, uh, bold risk taking of Harvey Lichtenstein, also a mentor and friend to both of us. Um, and it forged you like you, you, it was baptism by fire for you. Um, take us back to when you're 29 years old and you're sitting across the desk from uh, impresario Harvey Lichtenstein and uh, he propositions you with a, a question that will ultimately change your life. Who was Harvey and, and what was that moment like to you? Harvey Lichtenstein came to BAM in 1967. He was a former dancer turned arts administrator. He had somehow been given this opportunity to run the Brooklyn Academy of Music, which at that point was a very rundown institution. Um, there were spaces in our magnificent historic 1908 uh, building that were being used for karate classes and travel logs. But someone offered this young man a theater and he said, I'm going to Brooklyn. Uh, he was actually from Brooklyn. Uh, and then he headed back in order to take this job. Um, he was a visionary, he was brilliant, and he was also a very complicated guy. Working for Harvey, um, you learned everything when you worked for Harvey. I used to say, there is one God, his name is Harvey. That's how we referred to it at BAM. And he had some crazy ideas. Uh, some of them worked, and when they worked, it was fantastic. And when they failed, we completely went broke and had to reinvent ourselves. So. A lot of the stories in the book are stories about when they worked with Harvey and when they didn't. I mean, uh, here was a man with really no money backing the institution that managed to bring Peter Brooks' 10-hour Mahabharata extravaganza to Brooklyn and get a theater to, to put it in, uh, the, what is now the Bam Harvey Theater, and also was able to bring Zingaro, the uh, horse circus with 27 horses from France to Battery Park. So this was not a meek person, um, but he had me as his sidekick raising the money um, all down the line. And um, it, was, it was maddening sometimes, it was hard, but it was a great adventure and we were on a terrific ride. The day that he hired me, I sat in his office, he looked at me, he told me all of the problems that Bam was having, which began and ended with the fact that he had no money. And then he told me about his great ambitions and they were huge and required a lot of money. And then he looked at me and said, peering straight into my eyes, Karen, I need someone who can work like hell. And I said, Harvey, I'm your gal. He hired me, we shook hands, he sent me down to Junior's to have cheesecake with the head of the finance committee, Stanley Kriegel, uh, who had been in Brooklyn since time immemorial. I was hired and the journey began, the adventure began. So that was the beginning of it. And, and uh, the, the first great failure was the BAM Theater Company that yeah. we referred to, which we yeah. can talk more about. Well, I remember because when I, I started to spend time with Harvey, it was toward the end of his career. He talked about it as the greatest failure of his um, his career. He could that he wanted to have a classical repertory theater in Brooklyn in the style of the RSC, where with a, a resident group of actors presenting a repertory of companies of of plays directed by amazing directors. And this is where you enter the scene. He's committed to this, um, and at some point uh, after a, a string of critical failures you realize that you know you're this this institution that you've signed on to be part of not only is in the hole but it might be making a nosedive um tell us about what happened and how you dug it out well when you are doing a play like the wild duck by ibsen and the new york times headline is dead duck in brooklyn you know you've got a problem <laughs> and then complicating that when you're doing a repertory season, it means that, you know, you're doing shows for a certain period of time, then they go away, another show comes in, and then you have to bring that show back again. So at the time, there was no internet. There was, there was no Zoom like what we had now. So you needed not only good reviews to sustain the thing in the first place, but to bring it back again, you needed, not, uh, you needed the good reviews plus enormous advertising dollars. 
if you're going to embark on an adventure such as the BAM Theater Company, you probably need three years' money in advance. Harvey had about three months' money in advance when he launched this thing. So therefore, without the reviews and without a massive subscription base, you're kind of doomed from the beginning. And that is, in fact, what happened. We were doomed. It fell apart. And we came very close to having to shut the door. Mm -hmm. What happened was I got involved in organizing a six-bank loan bailout. Six large banks in New York each gave us enough money to survive, not to thrive, but to survive. And this meant we could live another day. We took that money, we doubled down, and we found a new artistic path for BAM. Mm. We doubled down on Brooklyn and on the things that really were true to Harvey's core as an artist and as an impresario. Things that were edgy, things that were risk-taking, things that were avant-garde. He had spent time with Rauschenberg and Cage and all those guys in the Black Mountain experience um, in the 60s. So this kind of work was really um, close to his heart. Mm. So we created the Next Wave Festival. And as bad as the BAM Theater Company was, that's how good the Next Wave Festival was. <laughs> but this time, we raised a lot of money in advance. We created a very substantial proposal and we orchestrated a very strong group of donors that would come together and support this thing so that we knew that we had enough money to be wrong. Having enough money and being right all the time is great, but that rarely happens. So you need enough money to be wrong and make mistakes and still to be able to continue. And that is the kind of effort that we put together to back up the Next Wave Festival. And then we were out of the gate mm. with shows like the Gospel at Colonus, uh, the photographer Far From the Truth, there was work by Steve Reich. There was work by uh, Bill T. Jones. There was any number of people, Meredith Monk, and then came Tina Bausch and many other discoveries. The success of the Next Wave Festival was about blockbusters and discoveries and encouraging people to do more and learn more than just stay in their comfort zone. Mm. And that's not only how we built the festival. That's how we built an audience. Mm. Well, I'm glad you say that because I think... In some ways, the Next Wave Festival, you know, really snatched uh, victory from the jaws of defeat. And one of the uh, results was finding the audience, finding the audience for BAM. And you tell this great story, and maybe you could recount part of it about how one of your board members, uh, Judith uh, Dickin, was in, in the audience looking at this new audience coming in uh, with nose piercings and blue hair. Uh, an audience that uh, also, you know, through the work of some of your uh, people you brought in to go out into the art galleries in, in Chelsea and other parts of the city and even bust them over to BAM uh, was a totally new type of audience to be seen uh, at, in your space in Brooklyn. Um, and uh, well, maybe you could take it from there in terms of what the, the board member said and then what your colleague said about the audience. Well, actually, Judith Bacon was the executive vice president of, of BAM at the time. And uh, she was kind of dismayed by the whole Next Wave Festival aesthetic. Um, the audience, the work, everything about it was sort of a surprise for her. And the night that we opened the first Next Wave Festival in uh, 1983, uh, it was a real extravaganza. And as you say, all these kids were showing up uh, with the blue hair, the, the, the piercings, they were, they were fantastic. And uh, Judith Bacon came up to me. I was standing at the back of the opera house, kind of watching the whole scene, figuring out what was going on. And she said to me in a hushed tone, I have never seen a more unattractive group of people attend a performance event in my life. I nodded. She walked into the theater. Five minutes later, Steve Reichard came up to me he, had, he and his partner, Anne Lee Bay, were consultants to BAM about getting the visual arts community involved with the next wave, which proved to be another great strategy. And he turned around and said to me, also in a hushed tone, this is fantastic. I have never seen a more fabulous looking group of people attend a performing arts event in my life. And I thought to myself, wow. 
beauty really is in the eye of the beholder. But they are here, they are ramped up and ready to go. And this audience, coupled with that work, turned out to be uh, kind of a marriage made in heaven. This audience was ready to learn, to receive things that were unusual, um, to accept things they didn't already know. And it was, the, it was a great prescription for, for building this particular project. I love that story. And it feels like, you know, what do you think an adventurous audience looks like? Uh, you know, uh, and who's culture for? And, uh, you know, what a great paradigm shifting moment in BAM's history, also in the sort of evolution of Brooklyn as a borough, um, that this new audience appeared on BAM's doorsteps because of uh, the next wave. You talk about in the book also the, the importance of an institution like BAM learning to speak in one voice. And um, to me, this is really central to this core thesis that is at the center of the book, which is um, that, you know, it, this is fundraising is not something ancillary to culture or to the creation of culture. It has to be deeply integrated. And I feel like the next wave is this moment where BAM began to speak with one voice. And I wondered if you'd expound upon that idea a little bit more. You know, to me, this is a core idea in the whole world of of arts administration in, in certainly in my career and I think for everyone out there that is running an organization we all know there is a lot of clutter out there and in order for the messaging to get through there has to be continuity there has to be clarity and at the at the at the at the end of the day there's got to be a great program so the idea of speaking in one voice for BAM was that the marketing and the fundraising felt like the programming, that everything was unified. If you looked at the graphics, instead of having a land of a thousand logos, everything was consistent. Um, from the signage on the building, to the way the brochures look, to the advertising, every single component of the messaging was consistent and spoke in the same voice as the program. And that made it very easy for people to find us, for people to connect, for people to understand more or less what was going on. That doesn't mean that they understood every program. I didn't understand every program, but it meant that the messaging was absolutely clear. And in doing this, I think that we were able to uh, build one of the great artistic brands ever. Um, in fact, one time, many years later, a whole group of us went to see a show on Broadway. Um, I'm trying to remember what it was, but one of the jokes uh, in, the, in the show was um, the actress on stage said, I'm headed to Brooklyn to see, to see King Lear in Urdu. And uh, the audience left, but we who were going there looked at each other and we knew that we had done King Lear in Urdu, so it was actually real. I mean, one of the great things that Harvey believed in, and it's part of the one voice idea, is that when you want to convince people uh, that something is great and it's new and it's unfamiliar, the solution is to do it and 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 do it till finally you cross over. Mm. And this is in fact what happened when we brought foreign language theater to BAM. Mm. Everyone said, no one will come, no one will come. Uh, and our solution was to just keep on doing it until they came. And that is in fact exactly what happened. I love that. Um, I just shifting uh, to the next major event in the BAM timeline and also your own evolution as a fundraiser and leader. Uh, you mentioned the, the touch upon the Mahabharata, Peter Brook's nine hour epic. Um, you know, just to quickly jump in, uh, you know, Harvey, who always said yes to uh, everything the artist he believed in, asked for, you know, promised uh, Peter everything he asked for a, a theater. You guys found the money to transform the old majestic vaudeville theater on Fulton Street into um, into what now is the Harvey Theater, uh, the funds to you know, begin the process of uh, bringing the Mahabharata and creating it and bring it to bring it to uh, to Brooklyn, but at so a certain point, there was such a deficit in terms of the funds you needed to actually execute this massive project, which also shifted the paradigm for people's perception of what BAM was and what it could do. 
that you had to adopt totally radical fundraising strategies that involved involving the people who would end up paying for it in the process of its creation and bringing it to Brooklyn. I wonder if you talk about bringing that group over to Paris and how that shifted your 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 notion of like what the best strategies sometimes are for fundraising. The whole adventure of the Mahabharata, which takes up a full chapter in the book, um, is was quite remarkable. First of all, I will say without any hesitation that after 36 years and a lot of shows, there was nothing like this one, and there never will be. It was something really special. Not only was it nine hours long, it was like a religious experience to see it and participate in it. Um, Brooke was at his peak when he made it. It looked remarkable on stage. The message was powerful. The theater was powerful. Everything about it was great. So when you have a piece like that and you're a fundraiser, you want to give it everything you've got. And um, we decided that the best way to get people involved in funding something that seemed so audacious, so unfamiliar, and was so expensive was to take them to France to see it in French. That in itself was a complicated situation since it was nine hours long. We embarked on this uh, adventure of uh, asking these people to go. Uh, they agreed to go. And right before we were going, uh, there was a the Libyan uh, international crisis. No one was going to Europe. Um, I called all of these donors. They decided to forge ahead. We end up in Paris, and we are the only Americans there. Now, this was also a strange situation because generally we know that the French aren't always the friendliest people when it comes to dealing with American tourists. When we got there though, because we were the only game in town, they couldn't wait to host us and uh, therefore went out of their way to make us feel welcome. Um, so we took them uh, to Paris. They saw the show. Um, we prepped each uh, section of it so that people had an idea of what was going on. Um, but the visual nature of it, the remarkable theatricality of it, won the day. Mm. Um, and uh, before we uh, showed them, before the final section, we showed them the work over three nights. Before the final section, uh, we took them to a lunch where Peter Brook and Jean-Claude Carrier, who co-wrote the script with him, um, started talking about how they made the work, how it came to them. And we were in a kind of a drab room in a hotel in Paris um, with about 20 people around the table. And as they began telling the story, it was like the walls of the room disappeared. And I, I won't tell the whole thing, but very briefly what they described is that Brooke was doing a piece of theater I'm not even sure where, called UFA. Mm -hmm. uh, it was about the Vietnam War and uh, the whole draft resistance and so on. Someone came uh, in the audience to him after the show and handed him a piece of paper. And on this piece of paper, it said, everything you need to know about the world is written on this scrap of paper. And it was a small paragraph, a section from the Bhagavad Gita. And Peter Brook read it and he said, wow, what is this? He learned what it was and that it was a piece of the Mahabharata, this, these books that were longer than the Bible. He became so uh, excited and obsessed with understanding this miraculous spiritual work that he and Jean-Claude uh, found an oral historian. And they went night after night, week after week, and were told the great story of the Mahabharata the way it had been told centuries ago through, uh, through an oral uh, history. And out of it, they crafted this theater piece that was nine hours long. So as he told this story, uh, not only were we completely blown away, but we could see that the donors understood that something truly miraculous in terms of taking this great work and, and putting it in the theatrical context was, was, was happening. And of course, they all supported it. And it was so great that I said to Harvey afterwards, now we're gonna bring Brooke and Carrier over here and we're gonna do the same thing and repeat it 10 times and that's how we're gonna raise the money. 
And that's exactly what we did. This strategy of uh, involving potential funders or donors in the process of being part of it seems central to what the vision that evolved for you and for BAM as one of its leaders. And um, it's one of the things in reading the book and, and thinking about it that I feel like you know, um, a lot of the people, a lot of people in the cultural world miss. They they think that these are two separate things, but it's it's actually the um, the deep interconnection between the creation and the producing of the Mahabharata, uh, raising the money for it, bringing it to New York. It's marketing. It's um, all of it as one voice, one thing, and that the donors are part of the audience that feels part of the process of from the. Uh, oral tradition being passed on to them in a drab hotel in Paris to the nine hour epic that then comes to BAM becomes legendary and puts BAM on the cultural map again in another really profound way beyond the next wave festival. You know, we're only scratching the surface of the first 30 of your book so far and we're halfway through our tight hour. Uh, but um, I, I'm just we're going to leave people wanting more anyway, because I hope everyone here will go out and pre order the book after after the session, but which is to say, we could talk for five hours, we could talk for nine hours and still only scratch the surface of all the great stories uh, in this book and in your career. Um, but um, this, this, uh, this, this Mahabharata and the uh, Next Wave Festival becomes a turning point for BAM, also for you as a leader. And I'm gonna leave it there for a second before we maybe return to the question of your ascending to the position of president and Overcoming founder syndrome, which is something that almost all nonprofits uh, suffer from when there's a charismatic leader like Harvey in a position of a visionary uh, position. Um, but before we do that, I want to acknowledge that uh, two of your friends whom we invited to be part of this conversation and we're sort of right on time now. Uh, uh, Rufus Wainwright and Jorn Weisbro uh, are joining us from the West Coast today and um, we wanted to go to them as the sort of beginning of um, reaching out to you, the audience. And as Rufus and um, Jorn offer some of their reflections on their friendship and multiple collaborations with Karen, I just want to say to you, the audience, those who are with us today, we want to keep this open and flowing. We really do want to hear from you and start hearing your questions and thoughts based on what you've heard so far and also um, what it's stirred in you. So as they're speaking, maybe you could be thinking about what you want to say. And then as soon as you're done, uh, they're done with some of their thoughts, we'll reach out to you and some of you can uh, sort of take the lead and asking some questions of Karen. But Jorn and Rufus, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're really grateful. And, um, you know, I, I met you in the at Karen's uh, home years ago and, um, you know, got to uh, spend some time with all of you and uh, see the like depth of the connection you all have and the history you all have together. So we thought it would be a good idea just to broaden the circle a little bit and ask you to maybe tell us a little bit about your friendship with Karen, your collaboration, how it began and how it evolved. and. Um, why everyone should go out and get this book and, and read it and uh, all of the above. So over to you. Well, I, I think we first met, I, I first met Karen, uh, it was in Banff, at the Banff um, Center. That's right. Uh, and, and, and of course it was, you know, um, in, 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 uh, in keeping with the wonderful atmospheric you know, <clears throat> life that we all lead. I mean, it was in this very beautiful kind of German style ski schloss or something a, a la Canada. So with, you know, uh, antlers everywhere and we had like some fondue or something, but it was just, it was just very glamorous to begin with. Uh, and it hasn't ceased to be so. Um, but, but I think, I mean, before that, there was sort of, I've known Karen for, I was Robert Wilson's personal assistant in my, early 20s or or maybe better personal slave um, <laughs> although i have to say it was uh, it was really the greatest school i've had in my in my entire life and i'm i'm still very close with him and really consider him a great mentor and and friend so i've been sort of tangentially known karen through bob's work at bam i was his assistant when he did a uh, uh, um uh, um Strindberg play, uh, the dream play at, at BAM, et cetera, et cetera. But then we sort of, we kind of had like a, a nuclear reaction to our friendship, which was at a donor's birthday. So I was working for Rob Wilson at the time, and I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna name the name of the donor, sort of, right, Karen? But so it was his birthday, 75th birthday or something like that. And he celebrated it at his 
gorgeous apartment on Central Park West. And there were a lot of people there and I was invited and Karen was invited too. And I was already there and Karen came in and she went over to the donor and had a big present for him. And she was telling the donor and she was glowing and she said, you know, it's so wonderful to be here and you've been such a, you know, amazing supporter of BAMs and, and uh, I have this BAM 150th book and then you are featured in it and it's really beautiful and I'm so proud and it's a legacy to, you know, everything that you've done to bring this radical work to, you know, New York, et cetera, et cetera. And he looked at it and he said, I don't want it. It's too heavy. I don't have a space for it. Please take it back. <laughs> and, uh, and, Karen, and Karen looked to me and I looked at her and we both started laughing hysterically in a way. And um, because this is sort of the kind of humiliation, I think, you know, that you go through day in and day out when you work with, uh, with donors. And it was sort of in that moment where our friendship really was born. And then a week later or something like that, we were both, um, I think we were both at this band summit. And then, you know, we sort of had dinner there for the first time with, with Ron, um, 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 Kant's a former partner and, uh, and Rufus and sort of, and it yeah. really also it really showed been, the kind yeah. of mensch yeah. I think that she is, you know, the, the humor. I think the greatest thing about Karen is that she has this vision, but she also has humor. She never loses her yeah. humor and her 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 personal side with the uh, you know with people. And it's hard. I mean, this is a job where it's probably probably harder than fundraising is even staying keeping your humor while fundraising. And Karen is a master at that. Yeah, so it's clearly not a job for the faint of heart. Um, and uh, but Karen collects lots of people like you guys who are also, um, you know, heavyweight as a, as a French friend of mine would describe that, that, you know, she has a gravitational field around her collecting people in it that um, share in um, the resolve to make things happen. I know Jorn, you've been artistic director of Luminato and many other festivals around the world. and. Uh, most recently artistic director of uh, WNET's All Arts. And Rufus has taken big risks at BAM, like putting on operas and um, Diva and which after City uh, Opera uh, couldn't go through with it. And um, lots of things that he certainly didn't have to do, but because of the friendship and the collection, con connection with Karen uh, emboldened uh, Rufus to take those risks. And um, I mean, it's grateful. I'm just grateful to have you guys. Yeah, Rufus, do you want to talk about? I um, I think yeah. from more of the artistic and uh, what I've always felt uh, with Bam and, and, and thus with Karen. Um, and um, is that, you know, there's, there's the, the, as an artist who, uh, who's had the really the privilege of being supported by that institution, um, there's, there's al there, there was always this kind of holistic approach you know to what i did as an artist meaning you know they they did my opera i did i did pop shows there the, we did um shows about my mother you know the, the great the late great kate mcgarrigal and 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 i guess what was most impressive is that there was never any kind of delineation i don't think i even knew what karen did really uh for for a good you know few years because i just assumed she was just part of the general artistic team, you know, and, 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 and there didn't seem to be these, you know, different departments that, uh, that, that were sort of, you know, in battling each other, though I'm sure that was happening. Uh, but, 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 but at least for, for the artist, it, it was always this, this major kind of concern to make him or her or them feel, you know, just really facilitated and, and free and, you um, and, 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 and unbound uh, in whatever direction they want to, to go, they want to go in. And, and, uh, and, that is, and, and now having, you know, written my second opera, the first one was Prima Donna, and now, you know, I, I, I've done Hadrian and there's other art institutions I've worked with. It's, it really is, it's dawned on me how unique that is and how special that was and how it really doesn't exist anymore. So, so yeah, it was, it was great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for the prima donna. Thank you. The, the, um, uh, uh, an institution as well as a friendship that emboldened artists to take risks. Um, 
And that's what connects everyone in BAM's gravitational field, but also Karen's as well. And it, it's wonderful to have the two of you here to sort of testify to that and speak to it um, and corroborate things that we've already heard. So and Brian, I, I, I just want to jump in here by saying that uh, there's a lot of Rufus and Yorn stories all over the book. Um, and particularly, I'm not going to tell the story here, but the book is worth reading alone for <laughs> the uh, weekend we spent at the Kennedy compound in Hyannisport together. <laughs> it was quite memorable, um, especially when Ethel Kennedy told Rufus, uh, told Yorn, Me. turn his cell phone off in her house. Yeah. Said, There'll be none of that here. In yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh my it's God. Got by Ethel Kennedy. Yeah. But, um, but, Jordan and Rufus have been amazing friends. Uh, we, we share the bond of Montauk. We share the bond of BAM. We share the bond of music. Uh, I first saw Rufus perform actually uh, even before I, I got to know him and Jordan as friends. He performed, um, Rufus, I don't even know how old, how old you were when we did Next Wave of Song. Yes, and yes. The curtain, I just want to recount this moment because I was sitting there in the audience, you know, it was another night at BAM. Every night was another night at BAM. And the curtain goes up and there's this young, like, handsome Rufus sitting at the piano uh, in a very tight spotlight. It's just him and the piano on stage. And he starts to uh, sing uh, Agnes Day, one of his great, great songs. And I turned to Ron, my late partner, and I just said, who is this fucking guy? He is... <laughs> Amazing! I said that, of course, in a hushed voice, given yeah. that he was singing. And believe me, there were a lot of nights when I did not say that about what was going on on stage. But <laughs> that night, it was another one of those great moments where your mind was just blown uh, by seeing and uh, and recognizing uh, a new artist coming to BAM whose talent was just was just amazing. And so I continued to be a Rufus groupie. <laughs> and follow him all over the world um, for all of his great shows. Most recently in London, um, when he did a concert at the Palladium uh, uh, of his new album, Unfollow the Rules, which is pretty fantastic. So we have we have a deep bond going. Yes. Beautiful. Well, thank you all so much. I, um, we want to leave time for some folks in the audience to raise their hands. All you have to do is use the raise your hand function at, on Zoom. and. Um, you'll be promoted and we'll know that you have something to ask. But as we're waiting for some folks maybe to raise their hands and maybe something has touched you or spoken to you or you confounded you in what's been said so far and you wanna to respond to it or ask Karen a question. Um, while we're waiting for folks to maybe raise, raise their hand or you could throw your question into the chat. Um, I, I'm gonna, I wanna go to sort of the next major paradigm shifting advancement in your evolution as a fundraiser, or you know, glossing lots of history here. But when you started to move BAM beyond its own walls, and um, in particular, there's a festival uh, on Ing Ingmar Bergman's work and his long relationship to BAM that leads you to make a trip all the way over to the, the Bergman's Island to put yourself before him and ask for his permission to bring a funder on board that will underwrite the entire thing. I wonder if you could take us into that story, but also talk about the significance of moving beyond the walls and thinking more holistically about what a festival or a presentation of an artist's work can be. You know, um, Harvey became obsessed with, um, uh, no, no, I'm, I'm mixing up the story. He did become obsessed with uh, Ingmar Bergman's work on stage, but it happened because uh, there was a bank uh, that was uh, celebrating an anniversary and decided in honor of that, that they would send a production of Bergman's Hamlet starring Peter Starmari as Hamlet. And... Um, I think it was Pernilla August as um, Ophelia, and that they were going to give this production to an American institution to present and pay for it. Well, no one wanted to do it because it was in Swedish, um, four hours in Swedish. And Harvey, uh, of course, raised his hand and said, we'll do it, and we'll do it in the opera house for 10 nights, which is like a massive number of seats. And I said to him, this time you really lost your mind. Um, how are we going to sell out 10 nights in the opera house of Bergman's Hamlet completely in Swedish with no translation? And he said, don't worry about it. The audience knows the play. <laughs> oh, my God. And we did it. And in fact, it did sell out for 10 nights. And it was amazing. And this launched this 
incredible relationship with uh, Ingmar Bergman, where we became the American home for all of his theatrical work. Um, and then Mary Riley, then our uh, director of artist services, who's also working with me on my book tour, uh, Mary at the time suggested to me that maybe we at BAM produce a citywide festival showing all aspects of Bergman's work. Remember, there was opera, there was film, there was theater, uh, there was writing, there were so many different parts of it. And I thought it was a great idea, convened all these institutions, everyone agreed to get involved. We went to the consulate um, and they thought it was a great idea, the Swedish consulate, and we embarked on a path of raising money from every Swedish company that had any connection to New York. So it's an it's a interesting story, but it finally leads to the moment where I have a chance to get a lot of money from uh, the company Vin and Spirit that manufactures Absolute Vodka. And they, of course, wanted to give a lot of money and call the festival Absolute Bergman. So I get on a plane, go to Stockholm, we're meeting with all these companies over there, we're doing the whole thing, and then we go and make the pilgrimage to talk to Bergman. Now he was in his early 80s at the time, but you know, he was he was a great presence. I was very nervous. And uh, you know, we did all of the formalities and then I had to uh, pop the fundraising question. So I said, Mr. Bergman, we're gonna do this festival. It's going to have this, 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 and this. We have all these great institutions. Um, and we know it costs a lot of money. We're raising money like really intensely. And um, Absolute Vodka, you know, wants to name the festival, uh, be our major contributor, and they want to call it Absolute Bergman. What do you think? And he looked at me with a twinkle in his eye and he said, Absolutely not. <laughs> and that was a classic. And so turned down once again, uh, but went back to New York and we called the festival, Ing I think it was called Ingmar Bergman, uh, an artist journey sponsored by Absolute. You know, it didn't have the same zing, but we got the job done. Uh, that seems to be a theme throughout the entire book, uh, overcoming these types of little and sometimes major setbacks to get the job done. But I also want to just say this also becomes a, a turning point for you as a producer, um, where you start producing whole bodies of people's work. Maybe it's the first time you did it on this scale, but there are other uh, artists you gave this treatment to in the years that follow that took you far beyond BAM and also into collaboration with lots of other institutions. And I wonder if there are a couple of highlights from that you might want to speak to. Well, you know, Joe Malillo succeeded Harvey as uh, the executive producer of BAM. I became, the job became like too big. The place was growing. Uh, we had more theaters. Um, it was too complicated for one person to do the whole thing as uh, the way it was in the Harvey era. So uh, now I was president. Um, Joe was executive producer and we had both worked for Harvey for 20 years. So Harvey had been uh, uh, you know, Joe has his artistic deputy, I was the business guy, and so um, together we already um, had a great, had a great connection, Joe and I, so we were able to do things um, because neither one of us was interested in doing the other one's job. Uh, we put BAM first um, and we worked on behalf of BAM, so um, it enabled us to envision large uh, projects um, where we would together figure out how to get them done, which projects would bring the glory, which projects, where could we get the money, and uh, where would we make a difference. And I think um, Rufus just referred to this, that our idea was to not do like greatest hits of anything, but to go really deep into the work of an artist. So when Paul Simon came to BAM, for example, and that took us nine years to persuade him to do it, um, and you can see that my theme here is uh, never give up. Delayed gratification is the fundraiser's creed. You're getting the whole picture. Um, but when Paul came, the idea was we're not just going to do one Paul Simon con concert. We're going to look at the whole 50-year career. So we ended up doing three major programs. Um, and we spent a month investigating the work of Paul Simon. 
But the other part of that was we encouraged the audience to come to all three and to see the, the way we were constructing these concerts. It was like a film festival, you know, where you'll go to see four movies a day. We encouraged the audience to experience all the different parts of this. Uh, when, when we did the Rufus uh, uh, concert um, based on his mother's work, singing the songs that say, I love you, we not only presented the concert, we showed the documentary, we had talks, uh, we, did, we did five things around it. And in that way, the audience has an opportunity to do more than scratch the surface of a thing. They can go really deep. That's great for an artist too. So that was kind of the way we put these things together. Uh, when we did the Muslim Voices Arts and Ideas, it was a very, very difficult um, project. Diseases were difficult, the partners were difficult, the money was difficult, everything was difficult, but it turned out to be um, a big success um, because we found seven institutions across the city that had important um, components to offer uh, an audience in order to be able to really experience um, the project at the deepest level. So this 360 degree treatment of artists or of themes like Muslim voices becomes also a strategy for building partnerships across cultural organizations. Uh, that is another major moment in your development and collaboration with Joe Melillo as, as, as it evolved over time. Um, I saw that Lynn Crawford had her hand up and uh, Lynn, if you don't mind um, unmuting yourself, we'll go right over to you. Sure. I, I really hate to interrupt these beautiful, fabulous stories, but I do have a specific question. Yeah. How much can you take what you know uh, from working at BAM and transfer it to another city? And how specific do your methods have to be um, depending on the location you're working in? So I love this question because I think you can transfer it anywhere. And the hmm. idea is this, that you go into a place and you say, what's happening here? What makes it great? And then you find that great thing and then you just blow it out all the way. And that's the way you do it. And, um, and I think that now, particularly in this COVID, post-COVID situation where, uh, you know, not everyone is, is, um, is focused on strictly big cities like New York or Los Angeles, but a lot of what uh, used to be called the nine to five cities um, ha have now um, see more energy, um, more culture, uh, larger populations as people are moving because of remote work and other things. I think there's an opportunity to ramp up cultural life by being connected to the essence of what is going on in that city and determine what makes it great culturally for residents and what would make it a destination point? And when you answer that question, you begin to find the work that will feed it. Hmm. Thank you. That's a great answer. Thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, Karen, I know you've been. Fact, Lynn, let me say one more thing. I think it's really fun as an exercise to do this, to put people together and say, okay, here's where we are. What's great about it? Who's hmm. here? What are they doing? How do they feel? What are they thinking about? And then to really do that. I mean, Jorn actually did that in a brilliant way uh, at Luminato in this crazy massive project that he did in an old electric power plant where he created actually a whole festival in one building where there were multiple theaters, there were young visual artists from Canada, there were things that were coming in from Scotland, there were concerts, and it was all in a, in a derelict power plant that was repositioned for the festival. And it drew people to a neighborhood in Toronto where they had never been and activated it in the most exciting way. This is an example of exactly what you were just talking about. What's there? How do we make it great? Blow it out all the way. Karen, um, thank you so much, uh, Lynn. Uh, Karen, we have another question that sort of seems related and also in the limited time we have left might bring us back to um, some of the things that BAM did during your tenure as president and also as Brooklyn evolved. Um, the question comes from Alice Bernstein, who asks, can Karen talk a little bit more about um, how uh, serving the community in which BAM is located? And I would tie that to also 
you know, the building of the art, arts district and its relationship to the organizations that then got brought into the arts district. We're mindful of the fact we have about five minutes and we're never going to get to everything. We're going to leave <laughs> this audience wanting more and they're going to go buy the book and they're going to show up at BAM to hear more. But maybe you can speak to Alice's question for a few minutes, uh, if, you, if you don't mind. So, you know, the uh, urban renewal had really cleared the area around BAM in the, in the 50s or early 60s. Um, some crazy policy, they had taken down everything and replaced it with a bunch of surface parking lots that then they never did anything with. So we were just kind of an island there uh, surrounded by a bunch of parking lots. And Harvey desperately believed that we needed to create a context for BAM and that the way to do that was to bring more cultural institutions into the fold right in the area. And this was a great idea, except once again, there was no money to do it with. Um, Finally, the uh, city was persuaded to get involved in the creation of the Brooklyn Cultural District. But like everything, it was funded, it was defunded, it was funded, it was defunded, and finally, it took 40 years for it to happen. But the beautiful thing that happened was uh, that we built the Cultural District, not we, but we meaning not just BAM, but uh, the city, BAM, and all of the organizations that came in and it created kind of um, a new type of cultural district, not, um, a, not a, a big performing arts center, such as you see at Lincoln Center, where you have a lot of large buildings, classical work uh, built off the street. Um, we kind of went to the next iteration of what we thought a cultural district could be. Institutions, small and large, visual and performing arts, ethnically diverse, racially diverse, all mixed together uh, as a metaphor for the uh, energy of a 24-hour, 24-7 New York City. That's what we were trying to replicate, and that is the community that formed in that district. There are now nine institutions in the core and another 55 in downtown Brooklyn, um, and um, an organization called the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership, which was actually uh, started by our BAM's chairman, Alan Fishman, uh, that looked at commercial development, cultural development, and residential development of downtown Brooklyn. These things came together and that happened. Simultaneously, we needed to address the issue of uh, ethnic and racial diversity. And in doing that, we needed to kind of go back to our roots um, and make sure that we had addressed the diversity issue from a staff point of view, from a program point of view, from a board point of view, from an audience point of view. And I won't tell you that we got all the way there, but I will tell you that it dramatically uh, changed and improved and, uh, and brought more and more people from many um, different ethnic groups um, uh, and a racially diverse audience to them over the period of time um, that I served as president. And this was the commitment that we had and one that we continue to need to focus on. Thanks, Karen. You know, there's a lot more about um, Karen and the um, BAMS collaboration with cultural organizations they brought to the community, but also existing organizations in the community, collaborations like Dance Africa, that you go into detail about, collaboration like Muslim Voices, collaborations um, ab about the you know, sort of, you know, the changing of the guard and uh, the, the easing of tensions with the community and the collaboration that then developed over time with the downtown um, with the arts district. There's a lot to talk about that. It was a like three hour Zoom just about that could be on it to itself, but, and, but we we're near the end of our time. Out of deference for the leader of the Brooklyn Rail, Fong Bui, uh, Fong, I believe has a qu one last question for Karen, uh, if you're there, Fong, and if you're not. Um, yeah, I'm here. There you are, there you are. Uh, hi, Fong, Fong um, yeah. with, hi, uh, as, uh, hi, Fong, as, um, as, uh, uh, editor at large uh, and colleague of the Brooklyn Rail, um, if uh, I ask you with all deference um, to uh, to ask a question under uh, thirty seconds of Karen, <laughs> so so that she can respond and we can uh, make this a relatively tight uh, uh, hour. But um, I, we Thank definitely you. want to hear from you. Yeah, very simple. Uh, been reading a lot of E.M. Foster lately, and one of the things he say is that spoon feeding in the end teaches us nothing except to remind us the shape of the spoon. And I think that the fact that, you know, you able to protect 
the artist's vision and able to put them, elevate their voice as a center um, of the, what need to be done. Example, what we did brought, in, you know, brought people to see Peter and Peter talk uh, is, a, is a very important thing to do. And I know uh, having, you know, done a little bit of fundraising myself, how difficult it is. Um, so it's very difficult when you ask artists the mission statement. I've been asked that for 22 years now, what is the mission statement of Brooklyn Rail? And I don't know what it is, except that it reflects the artist's arduous journey. So have you ever run into that hideous question, Karen? Like Many what? times, <laughs> but I think, I think we actually found it. Now, um, you know, uh, we said that um, BAM is the home for adventurous artists, audiences, and ideas. And the idea, the, the concept of keeping it to one sentence and not trying to get every single adjective and every single thing that you felt about your organization into that statement, um, it, it's not possible to do that. And I think that we came up with a very clean and beautiful answer. And I credit that process uh, to another former chairman of BAM, Adam Mack. Um, and uh, we worked with some uh, volunteer consultants and with there, they kind of led us to it. And then Adam kind of found it. And we all knew when we found it and it was thrilling. It doesn't tell the whole story, but it captures a lot. And, um, and just one final thing there, you know, um, I think you, I love that quote about the spoon because the idea we used to say to people, um, you know, Bring your friends, your, your friends are gonna find their way to Lincoln Center and Carnegie Hall all by themselves, but they need you to bring them to BAM. And we would tell that to our most loyal members and ask them to bring their friends and colleagues to discover BAM, and they did. And in this way, um, we built the most amazing audience. Um, you know, this, this young, diverse, energetic audience that was ready to learn. And now the tables are really turned. Um, instead of hearing all the Brooklyn jokes and reasons why people were coming to Brooklyn, I now say to these people, if you want to see your kids, you're coming to my neighborhood. So there it is. It's a good story. I, I love I love ending with this exchange between you and Fong. Fong has been leading the rail for over 20 years, making it free, uh, a service to all of us who read it and uh, this new social environment he created during uh, COVID with his colleagues at the rail, making it possible for us to have these conversations. And Karen, who led for 36 years, uh, the Brooklyn uh, Academy of Music. Um, there's no way to put uh, a punctuation mark on this uh, conversation. The only thing is to uh, dot it with ellipses and invite you all to the next major book launch event for BAM and that it hit me, which will be on February 17th at the BAM Harvey Theater where Karen will be in dialogue with the artistic director of the public theater, Oscar Eustace. Um, you're all invited. Uh, we're dropping the link into the chat right now. We hope you'll join us there. We hope that you will order uh, the book, uh, pre-order it, or I downloaded the Kindle version today. And you can see, and this is something we didn't talk about, but the scores and scores and scores of amazing photographs that uh, are in this book uh, published by uh, Powerhouse Books um, in this really kind of radical way. It, it reminds me of something that Fong would uh, have published. It's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's visionary and it, and it brings you into the vision of BAM through these amazing photographs that tell as much of the story as, as Karen's narrative does as well. So uh, even the Kindle version, you can get a taste of that, but hopefully you'll get a, a hard copy in your hands very soon. I can't wait to get mine. Um, I wanna thank uh, Karen Brooks Hopkins and Rufus Wainwright and uh, Jorn Weisbrot for uh, being our interlocutors today and uh, opening the door to our conversations about uh, Karen's career and the history of BAM and the history of Brooklyn and um, and then of course Fong Bui and Anya Bernstein and uh, your colleagues at the rail for hosting today's conversation. It's been an absolute honor and uh, we're excited uh, to continue the conversation uh, in the weeks and months to come. Um, with that, I just want to turn things back over to Anya who's going to introduce uh, our poet uh, Nora Claire Miller, uh, who's going to be closing out uh, today's session with wonderful poems. Thank you, Brian, and thank, thank you, Paul. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brian, for that, that beautiful uh, closing note. Uh, at the rail, we do have a tradition of ending all of these community events with a poetry reading. So yes, today I'm thrilled to welcome no Nora Claire Miller to the stage. Poet and multidisciplinary artist from New York City, Nora is the author of the chapbook, Lowell. Uh, Nora earned an MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop and a BFA, a BA from Hampshire College. Uh, so please, Nora, take it away. Thank you so much, Anya, and thank you um, to everyone at the Brooklyn Rail for having me. It's an absolute honor to be reading in such incredible company. Um, I loved hearing this discussion. I was once a blue-haired high schooler in New York City going to plays at BAM, and it was one of the spaces that first introduced me to some of the possibilities of avant-garde theater and to all that was possible in the theater space. Um, and it was just so wonderful to hear these stories, and Karen, I can't wait to read the book. Um, so I'm going to read a couple of poems today from my manuscript, Life on Earth, um, and this book is kind of one long poem that I've divided into chapters, so I'll read the beginning of each poem section um, with its chapter name. Okay, chapter 25. <coughs> Bless you. Hatred is very ordinary. The light on the porch of the new apartment is too gray. There is no way to fix this except to get different light. In general, things that have stripes tend to be good. In general, blue houses tend not to be content. If you put on a blouse, be sure to overtake it. Hatred is very funny. You wear your clothes inside out for a while. You get heavy with the smell of sheep and dead flowers or the wayside wind or molecules. Anyway, like I told Kate on the phone, there isn't any real way to get anger to count these days. It seems like in three or four ways, things just keep on gluing past it. And I guess there would be no place left to go except going is sub-zero. To get to the dial pad, you have to bounce off tables and come and go with lines. To get by on earth, you really have to hate it. To get started, you just have to get general, be good, be blue, be not impertinent, be vernal, gray, in a bucket of cereal, be whimsy, be grateful, be single-handed, be clawed, be ominous like a see-through violet. Chapter 27. So I became unrealistic and thought of days of how life on earth was a vanishing experiment in deciding or pointer fingers as the videos next door yell into their beers or their cooking, life on earth is intolerable. So acting becomes dangerous as does cooking each of us making our own omelets in our own apartments every Sunday here on earth. They say life on earth is a big disappointment, but I can tell you all the teeth I have. Incisor, incisor, premolar, incisor, molar, premolar, molar, incisor, molar, premolar, incisor, premolar, premolar, canine, canine, incisor, molar, incisor, Premolar, canine, molar, 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 premolar, molar, incisor, premolar, canine. Chapter 12. It felt like every person in the video was swimming. A person was swimming. A video was swimming. A person in a video was swimming, and the remote controls were growing out of the water. It was like everything in the video was being sewn or standing next to someone who was sewing. An organization is not a task that can be accomplished. A task is a task that takes no time but offers every solution. A shape is proximal to its axes. That is the beauty of shapes. We can stand very still next to them. There's still time to iron a perfect square, to press the daffodils carefully into the kitchen sink with water, to show other people how to speak to horses. You do it mostly with your eyes and ears. You do it mostly while standing at a distance. When it rains at a university, it is an indoor sort of rain. That is to say, it makes the shape of rain without actually raining. That is the beauty of shapes. Chapter 43. Every night I talk to my other selves from prior nights. We meet in the bathroom. We call ourselves the nightclub. Hi, nightclub, we say to each other in passing in the bathroom late at night the vent fan exhaling in the background. Life on earth sure is miserable, huh? We say to each other. We are all writing the same book, 
It is an inside joke. I remember spooning peanut butter in the kitchen at a job. The air outside was warm and the peanut butter was in an industrial sized bucket, not the huge kind, but the medium sized kind. And I was scraping out the peanut butter and it got all over my arms and all over the medium sized industrial sized bucket. I didn't know which to wash first. All night, the earth folding in on itself like mud. Chapter 54. A letter is like an olive, except then what? When bad things happen to good people, everyone says monopoly money, monopoly money. Get out the landing goals, outstanding goals. I'm sorry, I meant to say. The alphabets announce themselves. New updates ready to be installed. On my, oh, Microsoft Word, bring me to my knees. On Earth, update later. On Earth, restart app. On Earth, the letters hum and slow and wheeze. Okay, this next one is my last. Chapter 71, tell the truth. Okay, I made a paper pretzel. I took my body out of it. I chewed it on the stairs. I brought it back to life. I found a home I could be found in. I found a wire I could be called on. I found a light switch like it. I found the, the truth took too much time. A story was much simpler to convey. Nowadays, I try to move more quickly. I know how to handle things like elevators and landlords and fish slipping past me on the walk. I sidestep everything. I live like an afternoon always. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nora, for closing us out today. And uh, thank you to Karen, to Brian, to Yorn, to Rufus, to all of you who participated uh, today and joined us this afternoon. We encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel where we'll upload today's conversation shortly. And you can join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Lori Anderson and Paul D. Miller. We will conclude with a poetry reading by Charles Theonia. And you now uh, should be able to turn on your microphone and say thank you and goodbye. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Thank you everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. It's been a great thank conversation. You, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Nora. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. That was great. Thank you. Inspiring. Thank you, Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Nora. We're going to get the boat. We're going to get the boat. Can't wait. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. In pre-order. Congratulations, Karen. Thank, Thank you, Vaughn. It was great. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Thank you, everybody. Brian. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, and we'll see each other super soon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, Juan, and the team. <laughs> Thank you, you guys. Thank you for the reading. Thanks, everyone. Beautiful reading. Bye, Jimmy. Bye, Karen. Bye, you guys. Bye, bye, Juan. Talk soon. Talk soon. Take bye. care. Be safe. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Nora. Ciao.